Algerton, Managing Editor of the Arlington Catholic Herald. Today we're talking about the 2024 Oscars, which will be awarded March 10. Our guest co-host is Chris Gunty of the Catholic Review in Baltimore. Full disclosure, Chris is my husband. Our guests are two esteemed movie reviewers for Catholic publications, daughter of St. Paul Rose Picotti and John Mulderig from OSV News. Welcome to the show. Sister Rose is speaking to us post pizza dinner from Rome, and John is in New York. We're not sure if John has had lunch yet, but we're, <laughs> we're noting the time difference. Thank you. Great to be with you. Some of the movies that came out in 2023 were produced during the pandemic. We also had the Hollywood writer strike and then the actor strike, both of which hindered production and promotion of the movies. I heard that Bradley Cooper went to one of the premieres of Maestro, but uh, actually couldn't talk in the Q&A afterwards because it was during the, the strike. How did these circumstances affect the enjoyment of movies in 2023? From my perspective, I think that people who love to go to the movies went anyway, but I don't know. I always had in the back of my mind this fear of were we going to get good movies? What's going to happen next year? Because it doesn't take one year to make a movie. It usually takes two or three, even longer sometimes to get good films. But we we got an excellent crop this year of films, I think, a collection of films. And but I don't think it affected in the, the enjoyment of going. The experience is always wonderful for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to extend that to everybody. Good. I would tend to agree. I, I'm not sure that the enjoyment was diminished, although the choices may have been fewer in terms of finished projects. I would say in terms of wide release films, it wasn't a, that great a year, but uh, some of the smaller pro productions, the limited releases uh, were of high quality. So they're still uh, making good movies. There aren't uh, as many in wide release as there were before the pandemic yet. Uh, so in that sense, the industry is still rebounding. Um, and I think the strikes posed a further challenge. But we may be living with the effects of the strike for a while, as Sister points out. It was just another challenge for Hollywood as, as they were trying to pull themselves back up after the, after the pandemic. We're going to talk about the Best Picture nominees in a little bit. But were there other movies that weren't nominated for Best Picture that you both think you would have liked to have seen on the list? Sister Rose? I'm trying to think, you know, I've been in Italy mm -hmm. and uh, my options are limited, ah. you know, to uh, and I haven't seen a lot of off the marquee type of films. OK, you no, know, even though I have access to some links and things. So I'll, I'll just pass that one to John, because I think mm -hmm. he may have seen more than I have. Well, again, I, I tend to see the wide releases and some of those are of high quality, but a lot of them. My joke is I watch the movies where things blow up because <laughs> a lot of them are sort of mindless action films and things like that. I can't think off the top of my head of any that I, I would want to have seen nominated uh, for Best Picture. I have my favorites among those that were, were chosen, but I can't think immediately of anything that, that was uh, a glaring omission from the list of nominees. Okay. You know, if anything, the two foreign nom uh, nominations are the French-English one, um, Anatomy of a Fall and Past Lives kind of surprised me because those fall in that small film category, that independent film that I would I would call it that they and they were English and uh, and uh, either Korean or French, but I'm not sure that by themselves they even rose to the standard of Best Picture nominee. Hmm. I I just. Maybe I wasn't in the proper emotional space. All I can say is that <laughs> compared to these other films that were nominated, I was surprised that they made the cut. Okay, good to know. What about the redeeming movies? Were there any redeeming movies this year? Oh, you really want to know. So yes, <laughs> I am going to come out in full. Well, I loved... Um, you know, love is a hard word to use for some of these films because they, they handle difficult topics that don't make Americans look really great. And mm -hmm. that would be Killers of the Flower Moon and, right. of, co of course, Oppenheimer. Those two films were incredible films. I mean, as far as the craft of filmmaking goes, the stories themselves and Killers of the Flower Moon at least had some heroism in it, whereas Oppenheimer... Yes, looking from this place in history, didn't really have any heroes and, in fact, had some real anti-heroes. But brilliant acting. I want to give Robert Downey Jr. 
so much kudos and praise for for his his acting ability. He's amazing. I barely recognized Robert Downey Jr. in that role. Same. And even Bradley Cooper too. Oh, oh my goodness, but Bradley and Bradley Cooper is I think he's only at the beginning of his you know, was really taking off as a filmmaker. He's got so many years ahead of him and I want to see him do well. But here's the big film for me was Barbie. And you might say, oh, Sister Rose, of course, you're a nun. You are you know, you like women. You're pro-feminist. You're all this and that. No, <laughs> this film this film is Plato's Allegory of the Cave. It's about being human. And yes, being woman. But there's so much to it. I still have to write about it more. <laughs> but um, maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves here. We, we can come back to that in a little more detail. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. I'll, I'll give that over to John then for some commentary there. Well, I certainly loved uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. And uh, in tribute to that, I'd say, I, I usually complain if a movie is two hours and five minutes long, because if you can't tell the story in two hours, there's something wrong. Um, but to sustain that film for basically three hours um, is really an amazing achievement. I was less, in, well, I don't want to say less impressed. I was, um, I had my concerns about Oppenheimer. I think in many ways, it's an amazingly immersive experience, but aspects of the storytelling were lacking. I thought um, some parts of his background were very well handled, others not so much. So I, I felt it was an uneven film, although an, an impressive one. And then Barbie, I'm afraid I had a completely different reaction from Sister. <laughs> tread carefully john <laughs> well now you have to tell us <laughs> this is why we have the two of you on so. <laughs> balance maybe we should just just file this one under de gustibus uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, i don't know i felt it was uh driven by ideology and uh i always like the story of i think it was sam goldman who said if you want to send a message use western union i'm making a movie so I, I thought the message was too much in charge of the film. But again, that, that's a matter of taste. Did either of you get a chance to see Shelter in Solitude, which really kind of looked at the death penalty and in some exp in some way the uh, the church's attitude toward it? Did not get to see it. Yeah. No, that sounds interesting. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it either. Yeah. I, I interviewed um, Siobhan O'Hallen, uh, and uh, who's the the writer and the star of the movie, and uh, and it was an, a very interesting conversation because she grew up Catholic and her Catholic faith shaped uh, her her look at this film and this topic very much so. Um, she even has a uh, she she as a she plays the prison guard and she sings Christ be our light to this prisoner on death row. So I mean, it's really interesting uh, the the way it, it handled some of that those those topics. Um, it was very spunky, but it yeah. was poignant too. Yeah. So you know, and John, you alluded to it uh, the length of Oppenheimer. What's up with the length of some of these movies? You know, they ran two, two and a half, three hours long, and and sometimes I was like, okay, let's pick up the pace here. Why are movie makers going this long? It's because I audiences will listen. Uh, I wish I knew. I, I think perhaps with the rising cost of, of a movie ticket, uh, maybe they feel as though they, they have to give people more for their money. Um, but, you know, uh, in the vast majority of cases, it's just an issue of not being properly edited because other than a, a you know, beautifully mounted uh, uh, screen version of, of War and Peace, there's just no excuse for going over two hours in any substantial way i don't think and again that's a tribute to killers because um the fact that it didn't feel like it was three hours long was was amazing but for the most part i think it's just self-indulgence to be honest but that's just a guess well i can agree with that and i think that over two hours two hours and 10 minutes give us a i mean give us a break you know it's like a, a too long of a sermon over eight minutes or seven minutes it becomes more about the preacher than it does about the the person sitting on that hard seat. But Oppenheimer, there's so much of that that I could have cut. I would have cut. But, and and you know, directors hate to hear this. It was still a movie we need to see. 
It's a story we need to know about. We need to know what went on back then so we don't do it again. And because of what happened then, we live in a world where the nuclear threat is is omnipresent. We can't get rid of it. But Killers of the Flower Moon, I almost wish it had been a miniseries. Mm. Mm. I think it would have made a brilliant eight episode or 10 episode series, limited series. On the other hand, another film that was fascinating because some of that history I didn't know, and it made me go and look up more about it and to look at who we are as um, white people in America, because we're the, we're the newcomers. These are people who were here from the beginning. And so lots to think about. Just going to say the other outstanding aspect of that film for me was the emotional ambiguity surrounding Leonardo DiCaprio's character. The fact that a man could be in love with his spouse and yet do things that are the very opposite of loving, he made that credible. And I, I thought that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at one point he said, he said, I love money. He said, I love my wife and I love money almost as much as I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought he was a man who didn't really understand what it meant to have a conscience or a character. Yeah, He was caught, maybe it was because of the war he was coming back from. And he was such a kind of a pathetic character because he couldn't remain faithful to his wife, who was the epitome of fidelity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to admit that we have not seen all 10 uh, of the, the nominees for best mm -hmm. picture. Uh, a few years ago, they expanded that list from five to I think nine last year and 10 this year. So they're trying to get more kinds of films out there, but we've been, you know, watching things on prime and Netflix and Apple TV and, and that, uh, but let's go through these uh, one at a time and get your take on each film. And you want to set up the first one? Sure. So American fiction, it's uh, about a frustrated novelist who wants to prove a point by writing a hugely stereotypical black book. That's, that's the little nut graph on that one. So Rose, what did you think of American fiction? I didn't get to see that one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's one I didn't get to see. Okay. I'm so sorry. No worries. And no I, worries. And I can't find it. It's not online yet. Okay. Okay. John, have you seen American fiction? I have, and I, um, I enjoyed it very much. It had some elements that were problematic from the Catholic perspective, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with regard to younger viewers. But um, okay. I thought the social commentary was quite funny and, and very well done. Uh, so I enjoyed myself. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anatomy of a Fall is about a woman accused of murdering her husband. John, what did you think of that one? I enjoyed it very much, although it doesn't tie up the loose ends completely. Um, but it does engross. I found it engrossing in terms of uh, is she guilty or is she innocent? Uh, what exactly did happen? And I thought the um, her son, the actor, gave an outstanding performance, uh, particularly for someone of his age, um, in a pivotal role uh, because he's kind of the uh, as the plot develops he becomes more and more important to the story. Uh, so I, I was impressed by it. Okay. Well, let's go back and touch a little bit more on uh, on the first live action Barbie. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the apparent snubs of Margot Robbie for Best Actress and um, director Greta Gerwig. Sister, do you want to weigh in on that? Of course, <laughs> co-star uh, Ryan Gosling, who is just adorable in this film, truly Ken, in my mind, um, and America Ferreira were both nominated. So that was nice to see. But what are your thoughts on on that? I really, really liked Barbie. And when I was watching it, it was the first film I got to see after my knee replacement. Oh. I had to go to a theater where I could put my legs up, you know. Uh -huh. But because we're on a budget, I couldn't go in the section where they serve you food and wine. I had to go in the section where you bring your own water. But anyway, <laughs> aside from that, I, and the more I think about Barbie, it's so much about being human. It's not about selling a doll, even though I'm sure that sales went up. That's that's like secondary. To me, this was almost like the Krugs. I don't know if you remember that. It was about the family. It was an animated feature about a family in, in the cave and how they came out of the cave. So it's really Plato's analogy of the cave, the line. And it's it's how you come to realize your humanity. And that's what happens with Barbie if you go all the way to the end. And the other thing is, it's about self-awareness, of course. 
But it's also the exact same film as Lady Bird, Greta Gerwig's first film. It's a young woman coming of age, realizing who she is as a woman and taking her place in society as a woman. And so I think it had so much more to say than the people who just dismiss it. And the fact that they snubbed uh, Margot Robbie, who got the rights for this film and waited until she could get Greta Gerwig to direct. That's phenomenal mm -hmm. in, in its place. And then the the directing is is wonderful. The visual, the imagination of how they brought this out to be is, is wonderful. And uh, yes, America Ferreira, does give that talk about being a woman and the fact that Ryan Gosling repeated that back, was that at the Golden Globes, that he gave that speech was, I thought, very moving. And I think that people who dismiss this dismiss it at their own intellectual and spiritual and human peril because this isn't about selling dolls. This is about being human. And I'll stop there. Otherwise, <laughs> I will take all the air in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sister. John, would you like to weigh in uh, a little bit more? Well, I'll, I'll say that uh, to the degree that I have a quarrel, it's probably with the screenwriter, not with uh, the director. I don't, uh, they, she wasn't writer-director on that, was she? No. At any rate, it's, it, I would not have uh, been surprised to see uh, Best Director nominee uh, for that uh, nomination for the movie, because it was in its presentation, it was imaginative um, and had an interesting look and, and feel. It's just this, the storyline that I wasn't overly taken with. So maybe that's as much as I'll say. <laughs> no, I think I think you're right. And I think the storyline was almost secondary to the characterization. So I, I would agree with you on that. I was just to me, it was just fascinating. But anyway, another long movie, by the way. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so next one on the list is The Holdovers. And that got a lot of buzz as a feel-good movie about a student at a boarding school who has to stay behind for the holidays with a cranky history teacher and a grieving school cook. Uh, John, what was your take? I actually loved this movie. It was one of my favorites of the year. I felt particularly the ending. Uh, there's a, a theme of altruism or an aspect to the story about altruism that I um, thought was terrific. And that showed that, you know, it's sort of a classic example of not judging a book by its cover, uh, that the teacher's character uh, turns out to be quite different from what you go in thinking he is. Um, and I thought that was very effectively handled. If I may, I had a hard time with that movie. Not because I love the characters and even the the uh, the actor who that new actor, that breakout actor was really good. Can't remember his name. I'm sorry. But here's the thing about that movie. Everybody in that movie is a liar. It's all built on lies. And that completely took away my enjoyment of the film at the end of the day. At the end, I went, yeah, finally, he's Paul Giamatti characters facing the consequences of his lies. But they're all lying for each other. They're lying. They're lying. They're lying. And I'm going, why is this a movie to get excited about as a cat? I'm just thinking as a Catholic and a human being. It's not that I didn't love the the humanity of it, but I just felt bad that it had to all be built on lies. I mean, you need drama. It's true. But everybody's tell lies here. Sorry, John. No, I uh that's an interesting point. I would I would counter that the final lie, you know, Sidney Carton in Tale of Two Cities, when he goes to the guillotine, he's lying about who he is. But I found it um, even though it's it's not a straight presentation of the truth. It's at a sacrifice to himself that he's pretending that the circumstances were different. So I didn't find that a um, morally reprehensible uh, misrepresentation of the truth. And then there were er earlier lies. I think you could you could certainly debate how they were treated. You know, there there is the narrow definition that lying is withholding information from someone who's entitled to it. So you could argue that the people that they're uh, mis misrepresenting themselves to are not entitled to uh, the truth. But that's probably a larger moral debate <laughs> rather than a cinematic one. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about Martin Scorsese's epic Western crime drama. We've talked a lot about Killers of the Flower Moon. Just maybe even just in a few words, sister, should people see it? 
should they be prepared mentally for what they're about to watch? Absolutely, they should see it. You get such a long period of time to deal with what's going on that when it happens, it's not a shock, you know, like it could be if it had been compressed into two hours. Mm. But you feel such great sadness at the loss of love. I think this is a movie about love. And yeah, a man's inability to choose love of a person over love of money and to even realize that you can't take it with you but love you can take with you and so there's a great sadness if you want to be prepared for something be prepared for a great sadness and a great wrong that was done to the i think the osage people Mm -hmm. and not only them but of course uh, all of the american indian community uh wherever they are and this This kind of really draws our attention to it. I would love to see a version of this story told from the Native American point of view, though. Ah, interesting. This is told from the white man's view. And I heard that there is a book out there that tells it from the American Indian point of view. I would love to hear it. I would love to see another film telling it from that point of view. But this film got my heart, I think, more than any of these, I think this one got my heart the most. Okay, good to know. John? Well, I, I think uh, um, I would agree with all that. And I um, I also think it was impressive the way that uh, Scorsese balances sort of the epic scale um, with the intimate portrait of an emotional connection so that it's a big sweeping picture and yet it also is very personal. And I thought that was sort of the... the the powerful formula behind the success of the movie. Great. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what and why why it's sustained over three hours. There you go. Yes. I agree. Maestro takes us into the real life story of the long-term marriage of Leonard Bernstein and his wife Felicia while he was engaging in affairs with men. Uh, the score includes some of Bernstein's brilliant compositions and it's directed by bradley cooper who also plays the title role or he's nominated for awards for both of those john what was your take on this well um certainly in purely cinematic terms it was quite an impressive project on the other hand from a catholic faith perspective there are difficulties here about um infidelity and obviously the the moral status of homosexual acts but insofar as it's based on history that you know, this this all actually happened. It's not someone's imagination. I found it a, an interesting film, uh, quite well done, but, you know, it's not a movie for the kids, let's say. Right. Good point. Sister Rose? So I've heard, you know, from friends, some of them felt like they left out his, they didn't concentrate on his, his music. That's where they would have preferred the emphasis to have been rather than on his personal life, but it never pretended to be more than an emphasis on his personal life. So I think you have to give um, Bradley Cooper and the filmmakers a break there. I mean, if you want the music, you just do a concert film. Yeah. The whole soundtrack was Leonard Bernstein's. And the fact that the family supported the film was also, uh, I think, a a really uh, good thing. I just want to look at Bradley Cooper's performance was amazing. And so was Carrie's performance. I think she was very good, but of course, everybody falls under the the breadth and power of uh, Bernstein, of uh, Bradley Cooper's Bernstein. And, you know, the conducting scene is, of course, it's breathtaking. And I, I think this roster of films for this year, for the most part, has some really strong contenders. I don't know how they're going to pick the best picture. I know what I would pick, but these are some hard choices here. All right, hold on to that thought, and we'll wrap up with maybe both of your 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 top picks uh, for best picture. Uh, we talked a little bit about Oppenheimer, and of course it received 13 Oscar nominations. Um, the film details the work of the physicist who's often called the father of the atomic bomb, Sister, you talked about it being important for people to watch it now because of the the historic side of things. Anything else you want to add about um, your reactions to the film? It was hard to find anybody to like Mm. in that film. And that, you know, that's when I'm watching a film, 
I like to connect with somebody on some level. And it was really difficult. But I'm not saying that that's a bad thing in itself. But cinematically, that was a big thing for Christopher Nolan to take on. Because how do you make anybody likable? When they when they created the atomic bomb and then it goes on to the hydrogen bomb and then how badly Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was treated at the end for doing what he did to, quote, serve the country. But we see that also that the war was like within a couple of weeks of ending when they dropped those bombs. They never mention that they dropped those bombs on the only two predominantly Catholic cities in all of Japan. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Nobody talks about that. Yes. Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the two high Catholic populations. So I, there's still some unanswered questions in this, In this, but the immorality of what we did then, now we question it. It probably never had to happen. And yet what they created is with us now. And he, when Oppenheimer finally realized it, it was too late and people were not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to watch this film. Okay. Thank you. John. Oh, well, we're not here to have a historical debate, but I have a rather personal investment in this uh, movie because, or the, the events that it chronicles, because my father was on an island uh, just off the mainland of Japan and would have been in the first wave of our invasion. Um, and so uh, had the war not come to an end when it did, we the world would be uh, without at least one Catholic film critic, probably. Um, so leaving that aside, I mean, I think Oppenheimer as a character was interesting in the sense that he was torn between, uh, you know, the bomb was really developed uh, in competition with Hitler. At least that was the understanding. Mm -hmm. And he had a very strong understanding of why Hitler shouldn't have uh, the atomic bomb first. But then he, he came to see that this was taking us down a very bad path. So to the degree that he was ambiguous about his own work, uh, that mm -hmm. was kind of interesting and gave him some uh, moral status, I think. Uh, I'm not sure I liked him, <laughs> as Sister says, but I think the movie should have been shorter. Um, I think that uh, parts of the story were much better handled than others, but certainly an interesting uh, production. One of those movies kind of like uh, Hotel Rwanda, which I resisted mm -hmm. seeing for a long time and then finally realized I should watch this movie. You know, and I think I think we're seeing that in to some extent with Oppenheimer and with Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, the next one up on the list is Past Lives. It shows us a couple of co South Korean children who are separated when one's family emigrates uh, from South Korea until they meet again many years later. John, what do you think about this one? I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was um, quite touching, uh, very subtle and sensitive, uh, the kind of gentle movie that you don't uh, always get to see. I think somehow, particularly Americans are not especially good at making this kind of a movie. It struck me more as kind of a European uh, style movie, or obviously in this case, Korean. I thought it was also interesting in that it presents the immigrant experience in terms of the main character being torn between her Korean identity represented by her childhood sweetheart and her American identity represented or embodied by her American husband. So I thought that was an interesting aspect of, of the plot. Okay, I thought it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, John. I agree with everything you said, but I was surprised at how flat it was. It just seemed flat to me. And I, I think I... You know, sometimes it's a, the emotional space you're in when you're watching a film that that matters, right? Or your expectations. I am a huge fan of K-drama. I will watch almost anything as long as it's moral. But I think that um, if this one were, were to win, I'd probably stop talking for a while. <laughs> for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, when you say flat, I think I don't want to get into cultural stereotypes, but there, I think there were a lot of repressed emotions going on. And the uh, achievement of the actors was to convey what they weren't uh, necessarily expressing in the way, you know, an exuberant 
uh, let's say, American might just let the heart be on the sleeve. That was not what was going on in this movie. I wasn't troubled by that. I didn't find it flat. I found it kind of interesting in, in having to read between the lines and made it more visual than verbal. Well, you know what it reminded me of when I was a kid, our backyard backed up to the backyard of a girl I went to school with. And we used to meet at our back fences when our chores were over and we would just talk. And then all of a sudden she was moving away. I think we must have been about eight or nine. We were very young and I can't tell you how much I missed her. And I never, and I didn't have a, I had a two-year-old younger sister at that point, not much help in the friendship department at that point, but in the sense of missing someone that you grew up with, that emotion certainly worked. But otherwise, I still don't know how it made it to the best film list. Sorry. Interesting. <laughs> John, are we still friends here? Yes, absolutely, sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next up, uh, Poor Things. Just behind Oppenheimer with 11 Oscar nominations, um, Emma Stone plays a young woman brought back to life by a scientist, Willem Dafoe, in a fantastical tale of her evolution and fight for equality and liberation. Sister Rose, did you get a chance to see this? I did not. And you cannot find it online anywhere. Oh, okay. It's not on any of the platforms. And that is the film I would have loved to have seen because there's so much talk about it. And of course, I love Emma Stone. I think she's great. And um, so I I can't really speak to okay. it. Okay. How about you, John? Have you seen um, this? Unfortunately, this is another. This is one I haven't seen either. I'm hoping to see it in the next couple of days, but I I can't comment yet. The trailer is certainly interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll right. we'll leave that one there. And Chris, you want to pick up the next sure. one? Sure. There's another one. Uh, it's another uh, World War II era nominee. Uh, not fact-based in history like Oppenheimer, but it's called The Zone of Interest. It's about the commandant of Auschwitz and his wife who strive to build a dream life for their family in a house and garden next to the camp. Uh, just the description kind of gives me a, a, an idea of the um, the movie from several years ago, The, the Boy in the Striped Pajamas, uh, where mm -hmm. the, the family, the, the son of the of the commandant's family, you know, meets one of the boys in the in the uh, in the, the camp. And I will say no more about it, but you should see that one. Uh, John, what's your take on it? Have you seen Zone of Interest? Unfortunately, this is the other one I haven't seen. OK, so I, I can't comment. So is this the one about Rudolf Hess? Yes. Or, yeah. That's how you say his name. So I read the I did some research on it because I because I didn't see it either. And it certainly is one I would have loved to have seen because I'm rather always taken with um, Auschwitz and, of course, the Holocaust. It's something that still weigh, weighs on me so strongly. And um, I yes, I would have loved to have seen it. So I'm sorry I can't comment. Yeah. I've been to Auschwitz twice and I actually met the man and interviewed him, the man whose place Maximilian Kolbe took at the camp. So uh, oh. Franci Franciszek Gajonicek was his name. And he is the one whose life was spared by St. Maximilian Kolbe. So I have a connection to Auschwitz too. So I'm looking forward to seeing that Wonderful. when we can. Wow. Mm. Wow. Okay. Now is the time. The prognostication. Can I mention one short film that I saw that I really love? Please. Absolutely. Yeah. The Barber of Little Rock. It's a short live uh, documentary about a man who creates a micro economy for uh, people of color in Little Rock when they can't get credit, they can't get loans. And this is fairly recent. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. And if you've seen The Banker on Apple TV, it will remind you of that. If you've seen any film about these micro economies or these credit unions that are started in small communities, to be able to bridge that to build wealth in the underprivileged communities and the marginalized communities. I thought this was amazing, an amazing, beautiful short story. So I just want to put that out there. That's great. We'll have to look for that yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. Um, John, anything that you've seen that, that wasn't nominated that you would recommend to folks? Uh, not off the top of my head to tell you the truth. Okay. What about NIAD? I thought NIAD was excellent. Um, about the woman who swam from um, 
Was it Cuba to to Florida? Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to see that one, but it uh, it certainly got a lot of positive uh, feedback. I think it's amazing, just in the term of how much physicality that Annette Benning put into the main character. And I love Jodie Foster as her coach. I thought it was a great pairing of characters and uh, of actors in that film. And you know, I really for anybody who has a struggle in life, right? She chose that struggle, mm -hmm. but yet it can give you so much courage to keep on going. That's why I liked it. Interesting. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you, Sister Rose and John, for your, your best guess on which of the top 10 picture nominees will take home the Oscar. Sister Rose? Okay, I think Oppenheimer's going to get it. Okay. But I actually think that Killers of the Flower Moon should pick it up. Okay. Excellent. John? That's interesting because those are the two that I would say are the contenders, the main contenders. Mm -hmm. I would agree that it's going to be one of those two. If I were choosing, I might choose the holdovers, but <laughs> but, okay. um, but it, uh, yeah, I think um, my guess would be it'll be between those two films, Oppenheimer and Killers. Great. Now, the one I want to win is Barbie. We've heard that. But <laughs> I, I, that. I don't want to cause any, you know, conflagration here. But um, but I I have a feeling that given the fact that they didn't get Best Director and Best Leading Actress, I think that Barbie's probably off the, mm. they just put it there. The one thing I learned from that movie is I don't own enough pink clothing. <laughs> Nor do I, <laughs> obviously, yeah. nor do I. <laughs> so quickly, because we're we're coming to the end of our time, uh, what do you think will happen with the movies in 2024 and beyond? Any any prognostications on that front? John? I, I think we're still going to see the lingering effects, as Sister pointed out, of, of the strikes. It'll be interesting to see if the volume eventually picks up again, because it was around the middle of this year, I think, that it was the first time since the pandemic we had three wide releases in a week. It was quite common in pre-pandemic times for there to be five wide releases in a week. So we'll see how that goes as the year progresses. But the early months, we could still see a, a lingering effects of the, uh, of the strikes. I think that's absolutely true. And um, I still hope that they have some really good films waiting to be released that they haven't finished up yet, but now they will. Because... There's so many great stories to be told. And as we know, we have great storytellers out there. And my wish is that women can um, keep on going, that Greta, Greta Gerwig does not get discouraged by this and that and uh, Margot Robbie. And I think they're, take, they're being very gracious. Greta Gerwig's next project is to work on the Chronicles of Narnia. So that should be interesting to see. Whoa. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, we didn't talk about Taylor Swift. Now she didn't get nominated <laughs> here, and I. But I know, I I really admire her, and I admire her because she's given us stuff that is not violent. It's nonviolent. It's bringing people together. It's a, it's giving jobs to a lot of people. There's nothing about it that is. Um, disturbing i think from a, a catholic or even a parental point of view and except maybe the price of tickets but you know what she's been able to do i think i hope that other girls and women take courage from how to be a woman in a really tough business and to do it well with grace and with courage and with confidence i wish all the young women out there confidence excellent i did not know sister rose was a swifty <laughs> I didn't know either, but then I went to see the movie. <laughs> well, we have been talking today with daughter of St. Paul, Sister Rose Picotti and John Mulderig from OSV News about movies and the Oscars. You can find John Mulderig's reviews on catholicreview.org and you can read Sister Rose's reviews at sisterrosemovies.com. That's sister spelled out. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you for having us. Thank you. You guys are great. And I'm glad glad to know we're still all friends. So yes, that even, <laughs> even though we can disagree. We should just meet up for a movie next time everybody's in uh, North America. <laughs> you know, we should do that. You know, I did see Society of the Snow. 
Oh, and I think that picked up a, a nominee, a nomination in some categories that I don't know if you saw a live, you've kind of seen this, you know, it's about the crash of the Chilean rugby players. Remember back in the seventies, oh, I think, Okay, and, you know, and it's kind of tough to watch. And we didn't talk about Napoleon, <laughs> which I found exceedingly boring. <laughs> I didn't like that one either. So we found a point of agreement. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Special thanks to my husband and guest co-host, Christopher Gunty of Baltimore's Catholic Review Media. This is Ann Augerton, Managing Editor of the Arlington Catholic Girl. Thanks for listening.